Welcome to a sponsored webinar by Intuit, hosted by CPA Australia, transforming advisory into a digital art. My name is Kylie Baxter, and I'm a Digital Transformation Centre of Excellence member. We have people joining us from all over the country for today's webinar. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners from around Australia and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I extend this acknowledgement to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be joining us today. It is now my pleasure to invite Jimmy Nguyen, founder of DKM Accounting and Taxation Services. Today we'll be taking questions through the Q&A box. Please direct questions to all panellists. We'll address questions at the conclusion and do our best with time remaining. For any troubleshooting queries, please send a message to the host using the chat box. It's now time for our session to commence, so I'll hand over to Jimmy. Thank you very much, Kylie. Um, let me just share my screen. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining me today. I know that um, it's quite a busy, busy time for a lot of you, so I'll try to make the session as succinct and as practical as I can. Uh, today, I'm going to go over five things I think you should consider in your journey to digital accounting. Think about me. Um, I hold a Bachelor of Law, so a Bachelor of Accounting. I'm a partner of DKM Accounting. I'm a partner of If and When Social. I'm a co-owner of a small business franchise. I'm a small business tax specialist. I'm a QuickBooks Pro Advisor. And if you recently saw me on TV, and thanks to QuickBooks, I'm also an aspiring actor. Um, just to begin, tell me if this situation sounds a little familiar. You receive a phone call. Uh, if some business needs a tax account, maybe there are a couple of activity statements behind, or worse, there are a couple of tax returns behind. They tell you they use NYIB accounts, right? You think to yourself, are they going to be able to send me this file, or am I going to have to drive to their place? Or worse, they say they have nothing but bank statements, and they have no idea where their previous financial reports are. They ask you what you charge. You think, I can't possibly answer you before I see the work that's involved. You finalize the work and after a few grueling weeks of sifting through and making sense of unkept receipts, unknown transfers, and contraventionable movements of money, you journal all the MYOB stuff into your own software, because MYOB accounts by itself, make adjustments, and tell the client what to do on their end. Nine out of 10 times, the client doesn't make any adjustments, so you're in for a ride next year. You see that after all this work, the client is going to end up with a hefty tax bill. You also tally up your billable hours, and while you're happy that the bill has a comma in it, you notice that the bill seems a little daunting to hand over. After weeks of not hearing from you, and you call the client in, you go through each material point, you wait for the shock that comes with the tax bill, and you discreetly slide your bill across the table. You pray, the client pays you then and there, but really you spend the next couple of weeks chasing that big account bill, not to mention making sure the client pays the tax man. Um, that was a quick poll. Uh, could we uh, give that poll to everyone, Kylie, or? Okay, I'm just going to assume that uh, yeah, this situation relates to many, many of them. Because my firm has been, and many of the firms that I've worked with, I've met, and I've seen, have at some point followed a similar process. It works, or at least it works. But does it still work? For a large majority, sure. But in this ever increasingly digital world where entrepreneurs succeed at 18 instead of 40, it probably will not provide the growth and scale that it did in the past. With the explosion of software and tech companies that seek to simplify the B2B, the B2C, and the commerce experience as a whole, the accounting experience has changed, or has been forced to change whether it wanted to or not. We're in this era where the extremes and rigidness of regal and uniform legislation is being challenged um, by platforms and packages uh, that seek to silence and quell what was deemed the best practice in, in favor of simplicity and efficiency. 
right? So this, this ultimately leads to what is now commonly coined as digital accounting. And for many of you, you you've been presented with what's called cloud-based accounting. But to clarify this conception, digital accounting doesn't eliminate the role of an accountant or dismiss the importance of accounting practices. It rather values and empowers accounting professionals by making their work more efficient. So before I go through these top five points um, that I think every firm uh, should consider in their move to a, uh, to a more digital accounting practice, um, I want to quickly go over the benefits. But as a bit of a disclosure, I, I understand that many of you may have already transitioned over. Uh, some of you might be running a hybrid firm where you have uh, clients on the cloud space and still clients on manual processing, or there may be a small majority or even a, a minority that go, I don't want to have anything to do with the cloud. All right, so we're just going to go over some quick points. I won't go through all of them uh, because, I mean, a lot of these are, are quite straightforward, but let's go through. And the first one is accurate and scalable. Software doesn't like to make mistakes, but in contrast, human error is inevitable, right? We literally have this thing for the percentage of materiality, which basically goes, if we if we see a variance of this much, we're just gonna, we're just gonna kind of forget about it, right? It's also really popular among startups. Um, for startups that are starting up, uh, managing their accounts manually works fine from a tax perspective. But even as the business grows, the good news is that the upgrades required in the cloud space are necessarily relative to uh, the requirements of the business. So, for example, let's say you find your business needing to um, transact internationally, right, or you have an international client. There's no real concern about multi-currency dealings and accounting because all you really have to do from a SaaS point of view is upgrade your subscription. You don't have to download or buy an ERP system, there's no gigabytes worth of software updates or anything. Remote access. Clients tend to call at the most inconvenient of times asking the most technical and loaded of questions. Can I buy this? How am I accounts working? And can I afford to do this? Your answer would either stem on the superficial sense. Well, let me check that for you. Real-time cash flow reports and dashboard reporting puts you in a much better position to advise your clients on their financial position. You are likely to be able to make better and more accurate predictions and resolutions on immediate and future concerns. I actually remember a time when a client of mine called me in the middle of their board meeting, literally eight people waiting in the background for whatever response I had at the time. It was crazy, but, but this is sort of like the, 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 the little access we now have that we're able to be able to do things like that. Uh, look at security and agility. These cloud-based solutions come with cloud skills what's called SSL technology for data encryption, encryption, which is the same sort of technology they use to secure bank. banks, right? With a digital accounting solution, you should be able to retrieve that or back up your data even if things go wrong. Easy invoicing and payment tracking, uh, gone in the days where you literally have to chase up your clients or see whether they actually receive the bill. Um, I know that QuickBooks and Zero have great functions to making sure that your clients and customers receive the bills and uh, are put in positions where they're able to pay straight away. Facilitates tax preparation. I love this. I, 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 I can be quoted saying this. Um, if you do everything right on your account, accounting platform, your, your, your bookkeeping platform, whether it be NYB, QuickBooks, and Zero, if you do that right, Preparing the lodgement form, the compliance form itself, is, is the easiest part of the job. This, this is what they want to happen. Right? They want you to stay native on the platform so that every time and they know that you need to transition over, you need to move over to something, so that the transition is made so efficient that 90% of your time is spent on the cloud account. 
and bank reconciliation. These reconciliation tools make it so easy to track errors as well as detect theft and fraud. I've been in a position where I've been able to see um, help clients find uh, situations where there have been fraudulent transactions and, 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 and situations where people were stealing money from the company. And now I'm in a position to be able to offer that insight where I previously couldn't. So those are the quick benefits. I mean, there are a lot more, but these are the top eight that I found. So let's move on. This is where we I bring us into the top five things to consider. Now, these are the things that I felt work for my firm. Um, I don't I don't know if they'll they'll work for you, I guess for each their own, but for me and, and Big Cam Accounting, what it did was it helped me make sure that digital accounting works for me, that it freed up my time uh, to move from a business operator to a business owner and increase my billing potential and well, the billing potential for that. So now what I want you to do first is I want you to empathize with the small business owner. Right? The thing is, digital accounting centers around the small business owner. This is fact. And here's why. At the beginning, at the at the precipice of cloud accounting, accountants were used as the BDS. We were the lead generators, right? And now these platforms direct directly market to the small business owner. I mean, why wouldn't they? The the, the buying pool exponentializes. But the problem is this software, this tool, this platform. Even though it's, it's marketed to the small business owner, it, it's a tool really for the account. And in my experience, no matter how overzealous the small business owner or the business owner in general, eventually they're going to look their hand over this platform or, or their ledger to an account. The problem is by the time they do it, it might not be in the state that you want it to be in. But, but I digress. Digital accounting centering around the small business owner. If we if we focus if we focus on uh, the characteristics and and empathize with the small business owner, you're going to be able to create a a digital accounting service that's that's really going to work. What you have to do first is you have to take a look at the fact that they have time for right. What they're looking for is for you to create a product or service your value in their time. How many times have you heard, I'm finding parking, there's no parking with you. Uh, I'm going to be late, I'm picking up my kids, I forgot, right? So, so obviously your service can't exist within that time frame, it has to exist in their time. They're alone. They're isolated. Many business owners start these enterprises um, pretty much by themselves. You know, they don't have an executive board. They don't have a, a CFO, a CMO. They're, 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 they're one and all the same. They're, they're a jack of all trades and they're a master of none. Uh, with this point, you have to literally cater to their egos because they've, they've read something, they've received some advice, they've, they've, they've watched a, a TikTok or YouTube video about how to how accounting works, they think they know things when, when they really they don't, right? But, but you need to understand that you're also servicing their ego. And finally, they're in desperate need and controversially and contradictorily, contradictorily you're, you're in, they're in desperate need of leadership. Um, see, if accounting platforms provide all the answers, then why, why need an accountant, right? It's the plethora of answers that accountants help clear up and make sense of all the information. I mean, how many times have, uh, has a prospect said to you, do you work with you know, tech companies? Do you work with influencers? Do you work with uh, plumbers, right? Because what they're hoping for is that you've been in the passenger seat of so many quote unquote successful businesses in their industry that they're hoping that you can share or shed some light on the secrets to success. So with this in mind, with this, empathetic approach around the small business owner, I encourage you to build your processes to service them 
when they need it the most. Because these guys, these guys are your, your client for, and I, I find I find accountants are very reactive to the clients that they get. There is never this sort of seeking or lead generation approach to accounting service. It's whoever calls them and asks, right? So which leads us into stack in the apps. App stacks refer to a community of apps working together for a common goal. These group of apps have different functions, right? But they help one another to achieve one specific purpose. Like gears, these apps, when chosen purposefully, uh, with your firm's current ecosystem in mind, as well as its future operating goals, will assist in reducing not only administrative labor hours, but also the labor costs associated with the accounting service. So this means you, you should be able to generate more revenue for the same or less amount of resources. Uh, so just to show you some insight, these are the types of apps my firm uses. And I'll quickly go through them one by one. Uh, so first of all, we have a customer relationship management app, right? Which ensures our firm maintains an, uh, a means to categorize, look up, look after, and, and correspond with our client base. We take this one step further by ensuring that the system has a way to leverage the customer data for our sales and management team. Uh, next, we need a fluid and receptive tax software uh, that, that has, the ability, has the ability to receive live updates and with no need to download gigabytes worth of software. You need something that will automatically update with respect to legislative changes. That will notify you of upcoming legislative change. You need something, a digital signature, communication gateways, knowledge bases, tax accessories like depreciation schedules and, and an interest calculation, right? compilation assistance with respect to financial reports and, and, uh, you know, and trust resolution, and a faster two-way two -way feed between your, your software and the various government agencies that you, that you API to and you connect with. You need a project management software. And this is where you really have to take a look at whether your firm is a qualitative or a quantitative firm, right? And you have to also assess the, the ability of your team to adopt things, whether they are a function over form or a form over function. When I used to work for one of the largest accounting firms in, in Sydney, they were transitioning from Windows Vista to Windows 10. At that time, Windows 10 had been available for five years already. So you really have to take a look at, you know, when you, when you subscribe or buy or purchase or, or, or invest in a project management software, you really have to, you start with a team and you take a look at the team, whether they're, they're a group of hypothetical engineers or whether they're creative. My firm uses something called Monday.com. I urge you to check it out. It's wickedly intuitive, extremely easy. And finally, client navigation, which is where we combine the client experience with the user interface, incorporating apps that mediate and control uh, how the client emotionally reacts, interacting with the various aspects of your firm, from, from billing to reporting to correspondence and conversation, uh, staff interaction and, and, and product service, right? So how, the, how does the client literally receive your service. And just to give you an example, this is one of the ways I suggest you do this. Are you hungry? Are you tired? Do you want to play? Life is a series of questions and answers. Do you like it? How old are you? What's your favorite t-shirt? want to know more, but if we ask nicely, we can get to know things even better. 
That's why we created Typeform. To ask whatever you want, wherever you want, and to get answers, to get close to one another, to get to know people better. Typeform. Ask awesomely. So that's one app we gave, and I don't know what happened there. That is a jump over here. Um, basically, apps like these ensure your hours are used effectively. Because whether you bill for it or not, an hour of your time is still time. Um, my next question to you guys is, do you ever register a company, an entity, whatever it is, a business name for your clients? Do you do this other side? Do you send a Word document to them uh, with sort of uh, you know, sections for them to put out? Or do you send a full appointment? Small wings, this is how mine are Type form provides for interactive uh, questionnaires, um, whether in, in, in they can be viewed on the mobile app, whether it be a website link, just take a look. So here's an example. Welcome to the Academy Accounting. You need to register a company for. Cool. You decided to start a company before we begin. There are a couple of considerations you may need to consider. Do it. Next three questions, please name from the most preferred to the least preferred three possible company names you may wish to apply for. And so on. Are you currently um, de uh, declaring job keeper extensions for your client and lodging the monthly declaration? Here you are. So on and so forth. Typeform's advanced logic jump functions allow you to conduct interviews without email. You're able to create questionnaires without the email. You're, you're effectively able to do less uh, and charge less, but more appropriately, you're able to do less and charge more. Right? Um, and what we did, we, we started investing in the customer journey and we placed the client Customer, uh, customer at the center of, of our And it's where this really cool quote from Mr. Wyatt comes from. Are you hungry? Are you tired? It's a data is a new oil, Mr. Murray Wyatt, that's CPA, that says that client's experience is the new oil. Let me tell you a little scenario that you may experience in that moment. You travel to the US, and you leave the airport. Uh, you type in your destination on your Uber app, there's no communication driver as to where you're going, or issues with domestic currency. The entire experience is frictions. That's the kind of uh, customer experience your clients will soon be positioned to expect. As accounting software begins to demystify uh, the work behind accounting services, clients are not going to unwittingly pay large fees uh, when they don't understand what value has been delivered. A two-way, one real-time register system literally prompts the client to ask you uh, what you've done and what you've changed. Right? These platforms ask the client and prompt notification uh, regarding upcoming obligations and FYIs. They're going to ask you, uh, are you aware of impending deadlines before you ask them? Uh, clients aren't also going to be able. Aren't, sorry, clients aren't 
also going to want to the hassle of traveling to their account for a face to face. They're going to be able to expect to, to sign any paperwork with a few taps on their smartphone. And they're most definitely going to expect uh, their accountant to be able to provide granular data about how they are making money and, and saving their money. I don't, have, I don't have that page here, but another, another app we currently use is something called Video Arts. Okay, it is a subset or a subsidiary of Typeform. And what it allows you to do is literally record yourself, or uh, whether it be a live video recording or an uploaded recording of something you've done, and send that to your client, and your client is then able to answer you via an audio recording, video recording, or text. So imagine, and they can do this on their phone, their, their desktop, their, their tablet. Imagine not needing to schedule in multiple calendars to go over the tax form, right? You're, you're literally catering and pandering to your client without lifting a finger. And, and they'll be able to watch things, your, your value prop, your, your value addition, your empirical analysis, all that won't get lost over a win because they'll be able to watch that in their time. Right? And they, they won't be asking you the same questions because, I mean, how many times has, has your client literally asked you the same thing over and over and over again? Is uh, a, a Mercedes with that, all that, all that kind of stuff, right? So invest in new ways of interacting with and engaging with your clients. And you can do this in ways that won't feel and literally won't come from a financial point of view, won't be a heavy investment. Type form is free, and video ask is like $9 a month, right? But here's your way of making sure that your 9 to 5 stays your 9 to 5. One way we were able to better engage with our clients was to create a seamless, engaging, interactive way to request information from clients and prospects without putting in the hours. We were able to perform follow-ups and ask engaging questions in an interview-like setting without actually uh, conducting the interview. And, and it's been absolutely amazing because you, you don't have to drain yourself by, you know, playing the, 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 the accounts man um, or woman over the course of an hour and you, you can just sort of get on with it. So when looking at these apps, really think scale with mission critical infrastructure. Look for scalable, uh, affordable and easily implementable back-end solutions, right? Avoid cumbersome, expensive ERP installations. Do it out in perfect stack. If something doesn't work, just drop it a new one. So we move on, moving on. Consider repositioning your positioning. Positioning is where your product or service fits into the market, right? It is a strategic exercise that defines uh, what makes your product unique and why it is better than the alternative solutions. So distilling this truth of your product in this way informs your messaging so you can effectively explain the value of your offering to your potential customers, right? My firm was faced with two continual and glaring problems, right? Our, our debts were on time, they were routine, and they were fixed. Our debtors, our receivables were, were late, sporadic, and unmeasurable. But there was this feeling that whatever we lost from one job, we gained from another. So it all, we felt like it all, everything just ironed itself out. And this lack of, of uniformity and uncertainty um, just became something we couldn't deal with, right? So in line with the certainty that we expected as small business owners and as consumers, we decided to productize our services. Uh, um, so instead of trying to sell a uh, potato, uh, we decided to sell the bag of potato. So we, what we did was we took the various services uh, we offered um, on a custom basis and uh, we turned them into a standard, consistently te tested, uh, packaged, supported, and, and marketed products, right? So this helps ease the sales process as it fast tracks the buyer's journey because your, your offering is positioned in terms that they understand. 
essentially what we did was we, we turned a, um, a, a service into a solution. Uh, this is literally the difference between asking how you can help and showing how you can help. You need to package or bundle your offering into easy to purchase products, right? You want to be able to sell your brand along with your offer. Um, remember that the, the reason you're doing this is to directly connect with what your customer is looking for, uh, to easily help them uh, understand what you do and why they need you, and then to get them to you know, quickly and easily purchase. So sell what you offer, yes, but package it into a format that your customers want to buy. And you can start by considering things like who needs you, uh, why do they need you, uh, you know, why do they want to buy from you, that kind of stuff. Uh, then productize your, your service by packaging them into one or several fixed offers. Now, I don't have the slide here, but we use something, and one way we've done this is practice ignition. Um, I wish I could have shown you the, the clip, but, um, but to go through my bundled service, DKM's AAA service model, that's a, obviously not there. I'll quickly run through how I, I sell the assistant uh, package, right? Designed for start. I'd say something like, are you strapped to cash and need to get your business off the ground? Have you found that a hobby and you, and you just need that extra bit of help to ensure the tax man doesn't come up? So already I focus less on the what, and I focus more on the how and the why. And you can see on the bottom of, of, the, of these two packages here, there's a big button. The client can actually buy it then and there. They can buy this service without ever talking to me. And, and, and I tell you now, you might not think this happens, but this happens all the time. And, and just remember, practice mission, we figure it out. It's a great platform. It's, it's built for accounting. Um, so it, it factors in you know, all the things that you would uh, with respect to your engagement but, uh, but I'll let you uh, yeah, Google that. So one way we've been able to acquire customers across every channel is through practice commission, right? But ordinarily this is an, era, uh, an area where the B2B, B2C consistently trumps B2B because it creates a, a seamless user experience across multiple channels, whether that be online, uh, mobile, uh, assistance, sales, you know, it, it creates what's called a, a basic buyer flow where for you guys, B2B companies often need to create a quote, right? Uh, a process that can be difficult compared to one-time product sets. You can't sell a quote without you because you're not there to quote it, right? So what you have to do is establish a fast, simple, and automated customer acquisition workflow uh, across multiple channels. And in doing so, you need to create support that mirrors Amazon-like levels of ease and simplicity. So, like, your, your, your services either bundled or not, um, they begin to take on a, a personality uh, and characterization of their own, right? So whether you choose to, to name them like I did, over time, your, your clients and prospects will gravitate uh, to the branding and associations that these services take on. It, it's not so much the individual value offering or even the process systems or, or touch points you provide. It's the overall uh, customer experience and perception of that offer. Again, I kind of recommend the practice mission. Please check it out. Um, So obviously, you guys can tell I, 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 I have created what's called a subscription model for accounting services. It's pro-routed, obviously, um, against um, and hedged against a financial year. So, you know, if their client joins in December, they'll get charged from July to December if they have, uh, you know, that reason for the year. But things I did to figure this out, right, because I know that many of you have, have seen accountants or many of you already do this. Um, or, or have went online and sort of saw out what the competition is doing. This is what the competition is doing. But this, I'm going to tell you how I did it. And so using um, 
my CRM system at the time, the software system, I'm sorry, uh, we collated as much information regarding our client base as we could from their paying habits, uh, the average billable amount, services provided for the average billable amount, their needs, and the perception and position on the value of our accounting work and so on and so forth. Right? So, after considering all that, we placed our clients uh, within three categories, which we, you know, are creatively named A, B, C. Right? So the A clients are the types of clients you want to work with, the ones that pay you on time, uh, the, the ones that listen to your advice, and the clients that return your emails. Right? The the B clients, um, well, they, they return your emails, but you know, maybe after five days, and they might try and negotiate. And, and C clients, well, I think everyone has C clients. And uh, they're the ones that try to game the system and that pays no value in what you do. Anyways, once we had this holistic view of who our clients were, we began to strategize who we wanted our clients to be. We then started to pull together aspects, aspects of our ideal client and appropriated what we considered to be our client avatar. Uh, so we considered things like where was the market going, what industries were moving, how much revenue is currently being generated in a particular industry, what age demographic we wanted to deal with. I'll give you an example. Uh, between 2012 to around 2018, the influencer market moved, right? They can't do it really anymore because uh, social media has changed the way it allows people to make money. But essentially, you had the millennial market um, within a year turn zero into six figures, zero into seven figures, right? And these guys, you know, they were out of high school, so they, they, they began to take money management a little more seriously. They were looking at advice. They wanted to legitimize what they were doing and say, look, this is a real career. This is a real business. So they were looking for that, like I said before, that guidance, that leadership. And perfect for accountants to jump and be like, hey, you know, this is what you need to know, this is how I can help you, and so on and so forth. And that's something we looked into. Um, but overall, the journey, this particular journey is deeply personal as it is strategic. Uh, one client's ideal client, sorry, one person's ideal client uh, would, would uh, you know, could be someone else's nightmare. If you consider yourself a bit of an introvert, then a client who wants to meet on a periodic basis would not be your ideal client, right? Uh, so from this internal and external revelation um, and discovery of our ideal client, uh, this is where we developed our standardized productized packages. Uh, to do this, we studied our A's and our B's. Uh, our B's are still good to work with, they're just not the best. And, um, we sought to understand the varying degree of services within these A's and B's, uh, as well as what we were charging, right? Ultimately, creating three tiers of services, progressively increasing in price as the tiers grew. Uh, we were, at the time, uh, confident uh, that this was going to be how we did business moving forward. From a pricing point of view, we jokingly deferred to a term we coined uh, true cogs, which took into account things like insurance, software costs, CPDR, association fees. Because, you know, if you, I mean, accountants don't really have cogs, but, you know, if you, if you put the wages against um, the income, you might not like the gross margin. You see, anyway, some of you may know what I'm talking about. Um, we also considered the capability and capacity of our team members, including the amount of clients under each accountant, as well as the, as well as the extent of their technical abilities and professional development. Most importantly, we uh, devised grouping scenarios to assess in volume uh, how many clients per package would be ideal and within the capacity of our firm's handling. But what's most important, and I, I can't stress this enough, right, is that your first iteration will probably not be your last, right? We have reiterated our package services several times in response to um, changing client demands, changing technological infrastructure, software that has allowed us to pass on the savings to our clients, 
but at the same time faced with obstacles that regard obstacles that limit things like operation. Um, and of course, you know, you also have to consider competitors <coughs> that may enter uh, with a differentiated offering. What you have to do is rapidly iterate pricing models uh, to, you know, maximize like subscriber acquisition and market share. So you got to act quick. If you notice, um, uh, let's use a very basic example, right? When STP came out, I'm sure many of you devised uh, a way to leverage that and sell that service, right? Um, as well as, you know, uh, applying for JobKeeper and all that. Uh, yeah, but for the thing you need to know is that you've got to be prepared to turn on a dime. Right? But the challenge is also not to alienate uh, your existing customer base. Uh, Netflix learned this the hard way. You know, you got to give your existing customers at every opportunity and only raise prices on future customers. Um, now, overall, pricing is probably your most valuable strategic weapon um, because it's directly ties to three fundamental growth strategies, right, which is uh, acquiring new customers, uh, increasing the value of existing customers, and reducing customer churn. Things like practice mission, you know, really help uh, cold down the, the various obstacles that come with, um, you know, like direct debiting or subscription payments. Um, but overall, when choosing something like this, you really have to um, consider a few things. Remember, the first thing is um, you have to deal with them, something that's accurate and provides intuitive invoices. Right? Gang firms will build their client a sale, a, a prorated account at different billing dates depending on what they're billing for. Usage bills, they have like, um, you know, uh, ad hoc work that they do. Uh, your bill should be accurate, simple to understand, simple to understand something that I don't I feel like a lot of accountants don't really stand behind. Um, and obviously the invoices have to be branded appropriately. Right? As a result, your billing system uh, must uh, effectively manage the many data and touch points needed to calculate bills clearly and accurately. I think what you bill as um, as your company's first step uh, to establishing a, a transparent and, and long-lasting customer. The system must also collect fast cash and, and settle quickly. You know, automation is key here um, to optim optimize any cash collection. The longer the, uh, the merging process, the more chance of losing the money. Uh, it's got to nurture and develop deeper customer relationships. And I'll use a, a great example. I'll defer back to that. Uh, you guys probably think that you subscribe to Netflix because you get access to thousands of movies and TV shows and whatnot. That, that's not why you stay subscribed. The, the reason you stay subscribed is because you feel and, and put that, sorry, and Netflix positions itself in, in such a way that you feel like it is consistently working to provide you the greatest, the best and greatest um, content tailored to you on an ongoing basis. So they consistently do feel like every time that $15 gets directed, direct debited from the account, that a service in some shape or form has been provided. And that's one of the dangers of, of, of providing uh, subscription-based pricing with your clients, right? Because even if the monthly bill is like a hundred dollars, they're going to expect that a hundred dollars has resulted in something of value to them. They, they want to get that hit on dopamine um, as soon as you know, that money goes out. So if you're if you're only servicing your clients at key points during the year, aligned with lodgement dates, then you know this idea that oh, I'm freeing up the cash flow by not like by not billing you once a year. That argument only works at the initial sales pitch, right? It's not something the client will consistently consider. If anything, they'll, they'll may become passively aggressive if they don't feel like they're being serviced on a continual basis. And you can do this in a number of ways. You can send your client 
you know, management report, audit trails about, you know, how you can manage the workflow, maybe even just a meeting, whatever it is that you're trying to do. I encourage you to make sure that you are consistently meet um, your client's expectations when it comes to payment or something. And I think that's just something, um, you know, resonant in all of us, that when we do pay for something, we expect some sort of value. Yeah. Finally, I, I encourage you to measure to get visibility into the right consumer metrics. What I mean is traditional uh, AASP reporting probably won't go away anytime soon, but accounting firms, if they choose to go down this way, they must focus on metrics like annual uh, recurring revenue, the uh, retention rate, and the uh, you know, recurring profit margin. Um, unfortunately, uh, many uh, many firms are flying blind, blind uh, since traditional financial systems don't provide these metrics. So you got to make sure that you set up a dashboard to track these important subscription finance KPIs from the outset, and, and obviously check them frequently. And my last point, and I clearly jumped ahead of myself here, higher broad. <clears throat> Accounting is no longer strictly a profession. I I once read, and I forgot where I, I saw this, it was either in the um, CPA guideline or the CA guideline or the Constitution or something like that, so don't quote me. It said, accountants are meant to be uh, the scorekeepers. Uh, to me, this is the one thing austere, uh, regal, and altruistically ideal, right? It's, a, it's a very ideal. But accountants, especially those in public practice, have always been more like business owners and if restaurants and retail stores can stand on entrepreneurial ideals, so can accountants. You are the professional, but your firm is so much more. You cannot rely on traditional accounting personnel to get your firm where it needs to be. More importantly, traditional accounting personnel are becoming a thing of the past. You know, I've met accountants who are photographers. I've met accountants who have art degrees. The big four have been known to hire people with liberal arts degrees. So what I'm saying is I encourage you to hire that BDM, to hire that marketer, to, sorry, marketing manager, to hire those that strictly are not strictly uh, revolving around the profession. Because these people have such an incredible insight into how people work with people, right? That you will be able to build a system that communicates with both your audience and your customer base and your future customer base much more effectively than accounting principles has taught you in the past, right? I place a huge focus on marketing and sales. It represents half my firm. Think about that for a second. Marketing and sales represents half my firm, not a small percentage, half. And with that belief, I've been able to create a service and that my clients gravitate to, um, not just based on uh, the professional aptitude of the team members. You can bring it down, you can resolve it down, you can dumb it down to something called brand. I have brand, but it's what happens on an ongoing basis, not just the operation when you're at, that has created this brand. And I'll tell you now, um, I have had clients in, 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 in Perth, in Brisbane, in Wagga, right, who have directly reached out to me uh, because the the type of account that they're looking for, the type of account that gets in changing the current terrain does not exist where they are. I mean, I should not be getting clients in Perth. My SEO is good, but not that great. So what 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 I'm saying is there's such a, a skill pitfall in the accounting industry, in public practice, and it's not the accounting skill itself that's lacking. It's the business services that are lacking. And, and I think that's a huge takeaway from what digital accounting, cloud-based accounting is, is trying to teach us. Because if you, if you go to you know, the accounting 
expo, right? There are, there are so many um, service firms and SaaS firms that are literally telling you, hey, thousands of accounting firms have adopted this technology. Thousands of accounting firms have, have adopted, um, you know, uh, outsourced technology, outsourced labor, whatever it is, right? If you don't, you will be left behind because it's only a matter of time before these um, support services for accountants follow the same path that QuickBooks and Zero and, and, and YRB have set when they begin to market directly to the small business owner. And you're going to, they're going to be more equipped than you to handle their own accounts and tax obligations and audit obligations and that stuff. That, that is not a future you want to fall behind. And uh, with that, I just want to say thank you for joining me today, those of you who stayed. Um, I hope my firm's history has, uh, has provided a little bit of insight into uh, digital adoption. Um, again, I don't claim to be perfect at digital adoption. Trust me when I say we've had, I, I did force through, but uh, it, even in light of the COVID-19 and all that stuff, our firm has, I would like to say, dominated and secured our relationships with both our current client base as well as our ongoing prospects. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jimmy. That was so informative. And apologies for the delay with the polling at the beginning, slight technical difficulty, which is pretty ironic given the digital influence topic of the webinar today. If anyone has any uh, questions, please type them in the Q&A box to the right of the screen. But Jimmy, I do have a few for you here. So the first one is, what are your favourite apps to use with small business clients as they are coping with the impacts of COVID-19? Zoom. Who doesn't like Zoom? <laughs> um, Zoom is great um, because it, it's so user friendly. I believe um, it's also based in a world the developer is based in a country that you can expect your information to be stored well. Um, you can record things. It's, it's free. I think that's why I like it. It's free. Um, the other thing is, like I said before, video ask. Uh, it's not meant for accountants, right? So in many ways, I I get, I'm similar to you guys, you probably get ads all the time, watch the ads, because when I saw video ads, they had nothing to do with me, it had everything to do with HR and things like that. But then it said something. In the ad it said, if you need feedback, this is the app for you. And I, and I thought, well, I need feedback because my clients aren't answering me, right? I have clients that are Vietnamese, are tall, you know, uh, international that, that don't work with my, my time schedule. Fine, I'll work on theirs, but I obviously don't want to be working. I'm nine to five, not five to nine. So I found a way to cater and service my clients without ever needing to literally be in the same spot at the same time. Yeah. So those are the two apps. Yeah, that's excellent. And if a firm has none of the tech that you mentioned today, because so obviously at your presentation you mentioned quite a few things. Um, you mentioned Video Ask, and I think you also mentioned Practice Ignition. What platform would you recommend that they start with? Would you go with one of those practice management style apps, or would it be more a CRM or e-commerce? The thing that the client will see the most, um, and for most accounting, public firms, that's probably going to be the accounting software. Um, I recommend QuickBooks because in QuickBooks you have there's so much thought uh, in a gear towards service um, that it will probably be already as a base uh, a great opportunity for you to expand the way you interact with your clients. And I can really tell you so. Um, you want to request a document from your client, right? QuickBooks will let you do that without actually needing to, you know, type out an email or anything. They can upload it with the store in this sort of cloud store section that they have. And, um, and yeah, so I, I recommend focus first on the service platform and work backwards from there because that's where my firm started. You figured, ooh, back in 2012 or whatever it was, hey, 
online cloud services. So we looked at the thing we were going to be interacting with the client most and then work backwards from there. So, you know, what did QuickBooks need that we didn't have? And that's where I filled in the gaps, right? So start off with the base software and fill in the gaps. Yeah, so I guess it's about making the most of the software that you already have to start with, yeah? Yes. Um, and I, I, I will say this, I will add something to that. No matter what you pick, no matter what software you adopt, if it's a SaaS product and not something developed by Salesforce, it will probably only do 80% of the job. And you will be okay with 80% of the job done because it's better that $10 a month than 100% at $1,000 a month. Mm. Yeah, really good point. How did your clients receive the move when you moved to productize your services and went to that subscription model? How did you communicate that? Uh, multiple ways, depending on the age demographic, the type of client that, you know. So a lot of clients, you know, um, had teething issues with respect to the traditional service model that we were offering, like I said before, sometimes we like um, they would receive a, a tax bill, right? And then I, I would go, hey, by the way, this is my fee, you know, pay that to, um, and this was a way, you still the cash flow um, benefit, right? You don't have to worry about paying me, you won't worry, have to worry about me chasing you up. It's, it's one to of what you have to pay me for. Who you I just provide it. In addition, I provided, a, remember what I said about continual value prop? Um, every time, while they got billed, I also provided software support, right? So, so at the very least, this direct debit arrangement allows them continual service as opposed to retrospective one-off service, right? So I, I was building a systemic relationship or I allowed them to perceive a systemic relationship each time they got billed. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. And do you think there'll be a surge in smaller companies transforming advisory in the coming year? Do I see transforming advisory? Yeah, like I think the, that question has come from someone in the audience. But I, my take on that question is, do you think that with all the apps and, you know, the, the digital stuff around, do you think that more firms will be it's already pushing advisory? Yeah. What okay. small firms will be pushing advisory? Is that the question? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because um, apps like Zero and QuickBooks, they already tell you what your tax obligations are. Okay, so you know you're using the same thing they use. And if you do your, your if you do your, your job right from the get go, every time they look at their data, it's right. So it's making sense of that data and providing again granular information regarding what this data actually means. The benefit, the good news is. It can to, you know, write complicated reports. Apps are already able to make sense of data. Things like actually dashboard reporting, all that stuff, exists so that it can inform you of what so-and-so means. What does this number mean? Like, what does this number mean compared to this number? So on and so forth. The, the, the infrastructure it already exists for you to interpret client data. The problem is, most accountants aren't trained at this point to to explain what's beyond uh, tax legislation and or the various you know relevant accounting legislation that applies to them, but also more like well, what it means for them as a business owner, right? Well, what does uh, me saving this much mean over the next month, and so on and so forth? That there's no extended interpretation beyond this is what it is, right? And this is where your experience as a small business owner but in, in, and not in, as an accountant will shine through, right? If you succeed as a small business owner, you're going to be able to interpret better the information regarding your staff. That, that's just my take. Yeah, that's excellent. Really good advice. So unfortunately, we're almost out of time. Jimmy, I really enjoyed your presentation today and took a lot away from it. I especially liked your number one point, empathise with the small business owner. I'm a big believer in the power of the client advisor relationship. So that really resonated with me. So once again, thank you, Jimmy, and I'll now hand back to Melissa. Thanks, Kylie, and thanks again to Jimmy.
Thanks to all of our particip uh, participants today um, for joining the session. In the next three working days, you'll receive an evaluation survey accompanied by a recording of this webinar. We really appreciate your feedback as it is extremely valuable to CPA Australia to help us deliver better events for you. Thanks again, and we look forward to welcoming you to another CPA Australia webinar soon.